Hello, my fellow backstreet dwellers and nest occupants. It is me, Cypher, back, back at, at it again. again after spending many sleepless nights trying to catch rats. Here to deliver to you a very promising game. So have you ever wondered what kind of being the human subconscious would be if it were given a physical form? Like what kind of abomination would the 95% of our mind would be if it walked, crawled, and or slithered on the same ground we stood on? And what if characters from various literature fight them for you? Limbus Company has that answer. Wait, 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 wait. I know what you're thinking. Isn't this a gacha game? It is, it is. But don't leave yet and hear me out, okay? Limbus Company is a game where you command 12 people, and you, the player, are tasked to retrieve these items known as Golden Boughs, which are located on the deep end of abandoned and buried facilities. But you'll soon find out that there is a reason why they were abandoned in the first place. Now, it is a gacha game, and players outside of the gacha community who don't play such games may have heard bad things about them about how gacha games are pay to win or too focused with fan service who have big women with big titties or big men with b b big big schlongs or that their gameplay and story sucks genuine ass and it's just mainly a horny bait for basement dwellers I'm looking at you, Ezra Lane. But no, Limbus is different. And I'm not saying this huffing the 50 gallons of copium may have beside me right now. <laughs> no, Limbus Company is very free to play friendly. It has one of the best stories I've ever had the joy of reading. The gameplay is surprisingly unique and there's no titties getting shoved in front of you every single second. Fuck you, Ezra Lane. Limbus is developed and published by Project Moon, a South Korean indie development studio who is mainly known for developing Lobotomy Corporation and Library of Ruin. For some of you who know these titles, you know how good these games are. For those of you that don't know, I recommend you watch a brief summary for those two games if you're interested. But you're not here for that right now. Now, I know how notorious time sinkers gacha games are and for better or for worse, a Project Moon game. And I can understand that this type of game may not be your cup of tea or you're just too busy with life to sink another 100 hours into a live service game. But regardless of that, I will still review this game, hoping that it might catch your attention and give it the recognition it deserves. Very high praise for a gacha game, I know. But trust me, Steam Playtime doesn't lie. You're in a forest, running away from unknown assailants. You start talking about something, but you can't clearly remember what you were talking about. Your pursuers catch up to you. You try to intimidate them, but nothing comes out of your mouth. Only ticks? Ticks? Yeah, you realize that you've switched your head for a device resembling a clock. You try your best to remember what you needed to do but your memory is slowly slipping away. And what's worse, since they can't get any significant information from you, they decided to end you. Then BAM! A fucking bus comes out of nowhere and rams one of the guys. Then people started coming down from the bus. One of them started walking towards you, talking about something that you don't understand, yet it feels familiar. You see their nameplate. Faust? Is that her name? She continues speaking to you, reminding you to follow your star. Then multiple chains start breaking out of your head and piercing several people in the vicinity. She says, Now you, the player, or should I say Dante, not from the Devil May Cry series, from Dante's Inferno, command these people, or sinners as they would be described, you tell them to fight the arrogant pricks who have been viciously pursuing you for quite some time now. They fight, but uh, well... They failed miserably and one by one they die. Then a man with red eyes starts beating the shit out of them like, damn, they're losing limbs left and right. The man lets them off, but the crew who were supposed to be helping you are now dead. You try to convey that message through your tics, somehow he understood, but tells you that no one is too late, and that all they need is a little rewind. Suddenly, pain starts to surge through areas of your body, pain so harsh that you wish you were dead. You try to scream, but the only thing conveying your torment is the ticking of the clock going even faster than normal. Your consciousness begins to fade. 
but you see that the people who are lying on the ground in pools of their own blood are getting reanimated, their flesh seemingly returning back to them like it knew where it originally was, reconstructing the various mortal wounds that ended their lives, and they were walking as if death never claimed them. Dante. And everything fades to black. That, my friends, is the beginning of Limbus Company's story. Now, I'm not gonna go too wild into talking about the entire story, but the writing, pacing, and theme of how they play their story out is simply incredible. From incredibly depressing situations to hilariously funny scenes, they don't hold back. You are in the city, an urban complex which is the last known remaining bastion of humanity, with a dystopian cyberpunk setting where lives are cheap and death is cheaper. The city is divided into 26 districts, with each one being ruled over by mega corporations called Wings. They all have their respective letter of A to Z. Now these Wings care for their nests, which are presumed to be the safest places in the city. In contrast to this are the back streets where the wings care does not reach and any sort of crime being done to the helpless and unfortunate happen. Now it is in a visual novel style and that may put off some people. And I can understand that, but you'll be missing out on an incredibly well written story and casts of characters that you might potentially fall in love with. Just not too much, okay? Because these dudes aren't your random hobos found in the back streets. <laughs> Okay, maybe Heathcliff. But either way, have you ever read the book Moby Dick by Herman Melville? Or maybe you've skimmed through the pages of Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Ishmael and Rodion. If you've read those books, I'm sure you're familiar with those names because those names are characters in those books. And they're part of your crew. You see where I'm getting at? All of your sinners are characters, say for you, sang from various literary works. They're a part of this world, and each of them have their own story to tell. Some of them might stray from the original work or sometimes have similarities to their literary counterpart. Even some of the side characters that appear have ties to the people in your group. Don't even get me started on the voice acting. Now, it is in Korean and isn't available in other languages, but I do hope that they actually hire some English or Japanese voice actors because that would be very cool. Although highly unlikely. The voice acting is phenomenal. I may not understand a single word from them if I didn't read the subtitles, but man, you can definitely feel the emotions that they convey with every dialogue they put out. It's nothing short of impressive if you ask me. Remember those two games that I mentioned? The ones that Project Moon was known for making? Those two games share the same universe as Limbus. But you don't really need to know their stories in order to appreciate Limbus' stories. You know, unless you want... Was that the bite of 87? Then sure. Now, the gameplay. Go <laughs> I have a lot to say about it. The gameplay is unique in the sense that it can be overwhelming at times, but it's actually very simple and straightforward once you get the hang of it. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail because this is an overview, not a tutorial. But what I'm about to tell you is surface level knowledge. So each unit or sinner as everyone calls them have three skills. One defense skill, an active passive, and a support passive. We start with the skills. Utilizing these skills against the opponent's skills will result in a clash and you have to make sure that you have a higher role than the opponent so that you can win that clash and go straight for the kill. Each skill has coins with a minimum of one coin per skill. Now each coin can land a heads or tails and is indicative of how many times you can clash and how low or high you can roll. For example, Merceau skill 1 has 2 coins. Its lowest roll would be 2 and each time a coin hits heads your roll value would be added with plus 4, making the total highest roll he can get on that skill as Ten. Now there are factors that makes your chances of rolling heads or tails high. That would be sanity. Each time you clash and win against an enemy, you gain sanity. If an enemy dies, you gain sanity. If a teammate dies, you lose sanity. Positive sanity makes you roll heads more, while negative sanity makes you roll tails more. So keeping tabs on your sanity would help you in the long run. 
Do be careful with hitting negative 45 sanity though, because uh, well, your enemies won't be the only ones in for a world of hurt. Yeah, friendly fire is a thing in this game, and you can also panic. The same applies for your enemies, at least human enemies. Defense skills follow in the same manner as normal skills but have different functions such as defense, counter, and dodge. I'm sure I don't need to explain that. Now I know what you're thinking, but Cypher, what about the colors in their skills? To which my response would be, flashbang! During combat, you have to chain these skills and chain them with the same color you must in order to get absolute resonance which then boosts your damage. Each time you use a skill, you get Ego Sin resources, which then will be consumed to be able to use Ego. Ego are basically your ultimate skills. They have their own passives when activated and roll very high numbers compared to your average skill rolls. So they're used for winning clashes and making the enemy regret that they ever lived. Now there are two types of passives for your sinners, active and support. Active passives are used when certain conditions are fulfilled, such as in Merceau's case, you need to own two yellow skills. Whereas support passives only activate when you are not actively using that party member and they have their own conditions as well. Will all of this information matter? Probably not, because in everyone's case, they're just gonna spam win rate. Even I'm using spam win rate. The auto system is too great for its own good, and that part of the gameplay is what makes it feel redundant. Where the gameplay truly shines is when we are introduced into challenging content like Refraction Railway or Chapter 3 Final Boss on release day. I know some sweaty gamers are gonna try and say it wasn't that hard or just read. What I meant to say is going up against content that can't be solved with the win rate button, a problem where you actually struggle to find the solution to. The game has two types of battles, one being the normal one where you fight robots, people, or the Spanish Inquisition, and the other being abnormality battles. Now remember that part where I said you would be exploring abandoned facilities and that there's a reason why those facilities were buried and abandoned? It's because abnormalities lurk here. Now if you've played Project Moon's previous titles, you'll immediately recognize these monstrosities. But for those of you that haven't, these are beings or products of the human collective unconscious as a whole. Remember those German nightmare memes? Yeah, they are these guys, and you fight them to the death! Abnormality battles are vastly different from the usual chain the colors and they attack gameplay, because the battle system turns into an actual turn-based combat. Each abnormality has parts that you can break and destroy. Whether breaking or destroying those parts can benefit you or not depends on the abnormality. Oh, by the way, abnormalities don't have sanity points. Currently in the game, there are different game modes. You have your Luxcavation, where you can farm materials to upgrade your identities and egos. You have Refraction Railway, which is currently closed, and Mirror Dungeon. Mirror Dungeon is a roguelike kind of game mode. But regarding Mirror Dungeon gameplay, it's not really important. What's important is that you get three weekly bonuses for each week, and these bonuses give you a variety of goodies. You got the level EXP, the 250 lunacy, and the battle pass EXP. Now what do you get for doing the Mirror Dungeons even without the bonus EXP? You get level EXP and 10 battle pass EXP for Mirror Dungeon 1 and 30 for Mirror Dungeon 2. Keep note of that. The battle pass EXP will be important. Anyways. Let's move on to the gotcha. Welcome to the extraction tab, the part where you've all been waiting for. So in the gacha extraction tab, you can use special currencies called lunacy to pull identities. What are identities? They're basically skins with stats and skills. Identities have their own type of gimmick and playstyle. They have rarities which are double zero and triple zero. The more zeros it has, the higher the rarity. You can also get egos here, but these aren't your base egos. No, 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 no. These are abnormality egos. Yes, abnormalities. You can basically borrow the ability of an electric centipede or a headless blood sack carrying fish or a. What the fuck is that? Oh, my apologies. I didn't see you there. Oh, me? I'm just admiring my collection of three zero units. Oh, what's that? Gotcha. What's gotcha? 
I earned these bad boys by farming my ass off. You want me to let you in in a little secret? There are two ways to spark an ego or identity. The first would be pulling on a banner 200 times or 20 times if you're pulling in tens, while the other one would be with ego shards. If you pull a duplicate identity, you will get ego shards, which then are used to exchange for a corresponding ego or identity in the dispenser tab. There are 12 types of ego shards, each corresponding with their respective sinner. Here's the thing, gotcha isn't the only way to get ego shards. Yes, this game has a battle pass, free and paid. You can get various things here like ego, lunacy, some upgrade materials, yellow and red crates, very important. Its max level is 60. So what happens if you keep getting battle pass EXP past that point? You get yellow crates. You can open these crates and choose which sinner's ego shards you want to obtain with a chance of 1 to 3 ego shards per crate. Remember the things that I highlighted when I was talking about Mirror Dungeon? Yeah, the Battle Pass EXP. Well now you can grind to get those sweet sweet new IDs and egos. Now major disclaimer though, the Battle Pass only gives one per level if you have the free one. You only get two more if you have the paid one. So if you want more boxes while reducing your farming rate, you would need to purchase the Battle Pass. I know, I need to shut up about this, but the game is very free to play friendly and I am presenting people an option where they don't have to gamble their life savings away. Even still, I can recognize that this type of monetization is looked down upon and I prefer it to stay that way. But the game is just too good man, just please, spend responsibly. Ooh, gotta buy the big titty goth girl mummy. Fuck you Azerlane, fuck you too. So summing it all up, the story, incredibly well written. The voice acting, phenomenal. The gameplay is really good, but the difficulty needs a little tweaking. The gotcha, free to play. And I haven't even talked about the amazing sound design and art style that they have. These sound designs are so goddamn crisp. Dimension Shredder Yi Sang, listen to this. <laughs> That sounds so fucking cool! The sprite art style and the cutscene art style are also amazing. There are three different art styles in this game, each one fitting for their roles, one for cutscenes, one for identities, and one for during battle. Melding together into this amalgamation of awe and inspiration. And last but not least, the music. Oh, Cypher, you have high praises for all the things you mentioned. Why is the music last? It must suck ass, right? My man, my guy, my friend, my homie, my brother in Christ! You don't know how wrong you are. I don't think I needed words to convey the message. Limbus Company's premise is around the concept of death. But really, it's about life and death. About living. About how every person in this world has their own story to tell. Whether it be a melancholic scene or a vibrantly joyful memory. Life has its ups and downs, and everyone experiences it. 
Sure, we can compare to those who are fortunate or well off, but in the end, we need to understand that we're all different people. Living different lives, we all have different stories. And it's only really up to you on how you want to write the next page. Our time is ticking. Death will claim us. But it's just a matter of accepting it and acknowledging the fact that it's inevitable in a way. Therefore, you should live life how you want it to. Not to be shackled by all the crap people throw at you, but living in the way you ought it to be. Because by the end of that road, the end would not care about what you did. It would only care about the conclusion of the book called Your Life.